Good evening. Good evening. Good evening to all of you. Welcome, uh, Myrtle family. Welcome to those of you who might be on our Facebook page at this time. We want to welcome you um, to our second installment for the 2022-23 um, season um, for our program season this year to our Howard Haywood Lecture Series. For those of you I have not had the pleasure of meeting, um, everyone in the Zoom meeting I know, but if, I, if you are watching online and I have not had the pleasure of meeting you, I am the Reverend Alicia Marie Johnson, the Assistant Pastor of the Historic Myrtle Baptist Church. And we wanna welcome you to one of the wonderful ways that we get so excited about being able to honor the legacy of our late pastor emeritus, as well as to expand our minds in this moment at consciously as a church family. We have the ple pleasure this evening of hearing from our Edmund Kelly resident scholar for this year, Minister George Pratt. We are so excited to be able to hear our lecture this evening from him. Once again, greetings to you. Please feel free in the chat to ask your questions, um, and those will be addressed after we've had a chance to hear from Minister Pratt and his lecture. At this time, I just want to open us with a brief word of prayer that we might continue on in our events this evening. Assume whatever posture of prayer feels most comfortable for you, and let's center ourselves in this moment. Oh God, our help and our hope, we want to thank you, first of all, just for being God, for bringing us through the day, through the week, through whatever we may have encountered. We pray in this moment that you would settle our hearts and our minds, calm our spirits, that we might be able to commune with you, maybe in a different way than we are used to. But we pray in this moment that you would expand our minds, that you would help us to hear something new, to learn something different about you and about your people, about the ways in which you move in this world that aren't locked up and bound up in our, the, the congregations and the temples that we have constructed. But God, we pray that you would make us your temple in this moment and remind us that we are already your temples and that you would speak to our hearts and our minds. Uh, we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. At this time, I welcome uh, Minister Elijah Gibson Davis, our virtual youth minister, to uh, bring us some additional comments and introduce our lecturer for this evening. Thank you, Pastor Johnson, for providing us with a word of opening prayer. Again, we want to welcome you to our second installment of the Howard Haywood Lecture Series for this fall. The lecture series is named for our beloved pastor emeritus, the Reverend Howard M. Haywood, who led the Myrtle Church family in the spirit of love for almost 25 years. The lecture series seeks to bridge the gap between the church and the academy, allowing both scholars and laypersons alike to engage with one another in a communal space fostered by faith, love, and empowerment. Today's presenter is no stranger to the Myrtle family. He is none other than our resident scholar, George Anthony Pratt. George is a burgeoning scholar of Africana studies and American religious cultures. Currently, he is a senior history and religion double major leadership studies minor at Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia. George is engaged in various research projects as a Mellon Mays undergraduate fellow, a Quarterman Keller social justice scholar, and Abraham Joshua Heschel Covenant fellow. Most no notably, he was selected by the English Speaking Union as the 2021-22 Lord Morris scholar to study sociology and religion at the University of Manchester in the United Kingdom. George has presented his research in Black diasporic history and culture and gender studies and gender and sexuality, excuse me, at various conferences and institutions, including the National Association of African American Honors Programs. Georgia under, Undergraduate Research Conference, Mellon so Southeastern Regional Conference, Seminary of the Southwest, Morehouse College, and the University of Manchester. Also, he has participated in summer research programs at U Emory University and the University of Chicago, the University of California, Irvine. His main interests are Black religions, American religious history, gender and sexuality, intellectual history, new religious movements, and spirituality and mysticism. This evening, he will give us a talk on case studies in the philosophy of religion, examining Mother Willie May Ford Smith's religious experience and Abraham Joshua Heschel's philosophy of language. Would you join me in welcoming Minister George Anthony Pratt, our Edmund Kelly, our Edmund Kelly resident scholar. Thank you so much, uh, Minister Gibson Davis, for 
your warm welcome um, and introduction. I am truly excited to be in community with you all in this virtual space and to engage with you um, through a lecture in which following the, the presentation, we will um, engage and converse with one another through a Q&A format. So I please, um, I ask you if you have any questions during the course of the lecture that you notate it down and you uh, submit it within the chat or also uh, on the Facebook uh, uh, comment section, it will be noted um, and we will address it. I'm going to uh, now share my screen. I am truly uh, excited and eager to uh, share this uh, research with you all this evening um, in this second installment of our lecture series. Today's talk or presentation is entitled Case Studies in Philosophy of Religion, Examining Mother Willie Mae Ford Smith's Religious Experience and Abraham Joshua Heschel's Philosophy of Religion. Philosophy of Religion is simply the philosophical examination of the nature and meaning of religion. This scope of study reflects on matters of religious significance, including an investigation of various themes in different faith traditions uh, and also concepts of God or the ultimate. Students of philosophy of religion at the undergraduate level are introduced to significant thinkers in the subfield um, and various topics uh, such as uh, metaphysics, which concerns the principal things uh, such as being, knowing, substance, cause, identity, and time, philosophy of language, uh, which is the nature of language and its relations between language users and the world, and also epistemology, which references the theory of knowledge or ways of knowing. Applying these methods of philosophical reasoning to religious thought and practice can pose both a challenge to an undergraduate student and a religious adherent or practitioner, particularly one that is located in the African diaspora whose cultural heritage and personal experience is largely impacted by the African American or Black church. Understanding critical topics in philosophy of religion can emerge as difficult um, for a person uh, who is rather a student or a religious adherent within the mainline Black Protestant tradition, especially when literature is uh, mostly absent of the examination of themes and concepts present in various spiritual traditions and religious experiences of Black folk. The challenge rests in the creative act of going outside of written texts to identify, understand, and critique central topics within this field of study. For persons of African descent, locale and experience can easily inform this attempt. In pursuing this challenge, I considered my religious rearing in the Black Protestant faith tradition in the American South. I was then prompted to consider the culturally relevant examples and religious significance present in the 1982 documentary film, Say Amen Somebody. This film, I'm, I'm not sure how many of you have seen it, it's on YouTube, so you have an opportunity to watch the, the full film uh, on your own time. The film captures an overview of the history and significance of Black gospel music or gospel in the United States by following seminal figure, Mother Willie Mae Ford Smith, a vocal clinician and Christian evangelist. In this essay, or in this presentation rather, um, I will use an account of Mother Ford in the documentary as an entry point to discuss topics within philosophy of religion, namely religious and mystical experience. In the beginning of the film, Mother Ford describes how she feels when singing as a feeling within, you can't help yourself. She recounts, 
I don't know. It goes between the marrow and the bone. And it just makes me feel like I want to fly somewhere. I forget I'm in the world sometime. Upon observation, Mother Ford is expressing being subjected to a feeling that causes her to sometimes or to become temporarily uh, unaware of her physical existence in the world when singing gospel music. After review, one is prompted to interpret Mother Ford's account through the lens of philosophy of religion. As a result, the question emerges, can Mother Ford's experience of singing gospel music be classified as religious or mystical? Before this question is answered, it is important to note gospel music spirituals and cultural significance and sacredness by examining its origins. Both gospel music and Mother Ford's definition of gospel must be contextualized to read her experience and to explain why the philosophy of religion student is inclined to consider her account as a religious or mystical experience. To accomplish the former, I blur the lines of the Durkin-Hemian perspective on the sacred and profane dichotomy to underscore the nuances of reading gospel music as religious material. Gospel, of course, is a genre of African American music, uh, African American Christian music that expresses a personal or communal belief in the Christian faith that contains common themes of praise, worship, and God's goodness. While gospel music is composed and performed for different purposes, it is most often sung during religious ceremonies and services at Black churches. This cursory understanding of gospel could lead one to consider Mother Ford's statement through the lens of philosophy of religion, but greater context must be provided by considering the genre's origins to situate further analysis. Gospel music traces its root to the ring shout, a transcendent and ecstatic ritual practiced by enslaved Africans in the Americas and Caribbean, in which worshipers move in a circle while clapping their hands, shuffling and stopping their feet. Uh, the ring shout also re uh, reflects the cosmological understandings um, of different uh, indigenous African groups. Uh, Particularly, one example of this is um, the Kalunga line, which is a cosmogram which comes out of the Congo region of Africa, um, where it depicts um, the four moments of the sun. Um, and so cultural historian Sterling Stuckey, uh, in arguing that the ring shout was a unifying element of African bonds people in the American colonies that reflected their communal cosmological understanding, uh, despite their different or specific ethnic and cultural traditions, he concludes that field hollers, work songs, and spirituals evolved from it, shaping what was later identified as gospel, followed by blues and jazz. Samuel A. Floyd Jr. confirms Stuckey's contention in his article, Ring Shout Literary Studies, Literary Studies, Historical Studies, and Black Music Inquiry, by noting the many stylistic elements of the ring shout that formalized Black music styles during the 19th and 20th centuries. And if you see um, in the, the diagram that's on the PowerPoint, you will see how different uh, and various forms of Black uh, music evolved from uh, African-American sacred traditions. Gospel music must be placed in the context of its origins, especially when considering its function as a form of religious expression relative to the unique position of Black people in America in their collective struggle for human rights. While the philosophy of religion project requires an outsider uh, perspective, the African-American student examining gospel music roots in the ring shout, whose religious background is in the Black church, having witnessed the frenzied behaviors of individuals singing gospel, 
um, such um, as, as shouting, uh, cannot separate these memories and experience from their inclination to interpret Mother Ford's experience as religious or mystical. Additionally, Mother Ford's role in the popularization of gospel and her usage of the music requires special attention to contextualize her comments for further analysis. Mother Ford's style of gospel is sometimes referred to as gospel blues because of its use of phrasing and harmonic patterns similar to 12 bar blues. Gospel was revolutionized when Thomas Dorsey, the father of gospel music, fused jazz and blues with gospel. Dorsey's If You See My Savior, Tell Him That You Saw Me, was the first song he wrote that combined a blues structure to gospel lyrics, which Mother Ford popularized at the 1930 National Baptist Convention in Chicago. In 1932, Dorsey co-founded the National Convention of Gospel Choirs and Choruses, in which Mother Ford chartered the St. Louis chapter the following year and became the director of the National Organization Soloist Bureau, training emerging singers in the gospel blues style. Dorsey, interestingly, uh, likened Mother Ford's voice to uh, Bessie Smith um, and suggested that she was more talented than the famed blues singer and that um, she should have elected to sing blues professionally. And he believed that she would have amassed um, a, a wide uh, following. Initially, Mother Ford was rejected um, from many mainline Black Baptist churches because they viewed gospel um, as secular and unrefined. And this is a period of um, African-American religious history in which um, gospel was um, not viewed in the best light by traditional gospel churches. This was before um, a lot of your churches had drums um, and guitars and uh, most uh, a certain subset of black churches during a particular time period within the 20th century sung hymns um, and anthems and there uh, was organ music. And so she was, she was criticized uh, and also the spirituals of course. And so she was criticized for her bluesy style um, and she did not view it as secular. And so it is at this point, I use um, Emil Durkenheim's sacred and profane dichotomy to understand her treatment of gospel, highlighting the nuances of reading uh, the genre of gospel music as religious material. So Dur uh, Durkenheim, who uh, was a, uh, a seminal figure in the uh, field of uh, sociology, he um, develops this concept of the sacred um, and the profane. And he identified these divisions as a distinctive trait um, in religious thought, defining religious beliefs as expression, as representations that express the nature of sacred things and the relations they have with other sacred or profane things. And so in, in one case, these are, he creates a binary in, in developing the, these two categories, the sacred referencing the different elements or components uh, of a society that they view um, uh, that, that they view that has a significant uh, value and that they direct reverence to and then the profane um, being the, the secular and ordinary or mundane thing. So these are the two categories um, that he creates. He notes that the category sacred was intrinsically fluid um, and anything could be classified as such. What he identified as uh, critical was the social act of separation from the profane or how the religious person conducted themselves with sacred things. In Mother Ford's case, she marked gospel as sacred and blues as profane after undergoing a Pentecostal experience of holy baptism with speaking in tongues. She expresses this, I had no more desire to sing the blues, but I had the spirituals in my mind. This experience 
caused her to change her lifestyle, which included rejecting the secular music she previously enjoyed, noting that blues and jazz artists such as Bessie, Bessie Smith, who is pictured here, and Cab Calloway, who is pictured here, no longer held um, any appeal for her. Mother Ford proclaimed that she was going to sing gospel music to minister as an evangelist or revival worker. For these reasons, she rejected commercializing gospel music throughout her life, choosing to perform live at revivals, programs, and on the radio. Her marking of gospel relative to blues allows for Durkenheim's concept of the impurely sacred or sacred contagion to be applied to discuss the complexities presented in Mother Ford's experience and outlook. Durkenheim suggested that in some cases, an object could easily pass from one state to another and the domain of the sacred could contain impure powers. In this context, blues can be viewed as an object or profane thing that becomes sacred when its structure is applied to gospel lyrics. Gospel music as a sacred thing is an object of the sacred existing in its domain. When blues is fused with gospel, it becomes an impure power within the sacred domain for one who views blues as secular. The fluidity of Durkenheim's categories allows for blues to be, con to be considered sacred because it finds its origins in the same place where gospel does, the ring shout, a sacred ritual. The previous notion could also challenge the, the use of the sacred and profane distinction to read Mother Ford's marking of gospel. If blues is sacred and emerge out of the same sacred domain that gospel does, it would exist within the sacred rather than an impure power. Secondly, reading blues as sacred demonstrates that sacredness, and this is important, is both relative and situational. Um, depending on the subject, uh, one can have a different view of what the sacred and what the profane is. And the example is this, just as Mother Ford read the blues as secular or profane, Bessie Smith as a blues singer may have seen the blues as sacred, just as the ring shout was sacred to enslaved Africans, and their U European captors viewed it as heathenish or profane, mainline Baptists regarded Mother Ford's bluesy gospel style as secular, while she believed it to be sacred. And so this analysis problematizes the durkin hemian dichotomy, which has proven to be flawed, as noted in this scenario. Um, and it allows for the African-American philosophy of religion student to explain why they are inclined to interpret the religious material in Mother Ford's account from both an insider and outsider perspective. An outsider as a student of religion viewing a subject and an insider and, and also a religious, uh, a subject that is the religious adherent engaged in religious behavior and as an outsider, as a member of the black church um, and or person who is a singer or connoisseur of gospel music. When describing singing gospel, Mother Ford expresses a belief in a feeling within. She has no control of accompanied with a desire to fly somewhere, causing her to forget that she is in the world sometime. Her suggestion of an absence of reality when reading, when singing gospel spurred by a feeling within, which she understands as the Holy Spirit, prompts her to feel like flying. And this is also understood by others. William Dargan states, Singing has been for Willie May Ford Smith, a world in which she lives. Also singer and radio host Zella, Price, Jack, Je Zella Jackson Price remembers, Mother Smith was dramatic and she was Holy Ghost filled. When she said she felt like flying away, in your mind's eye, you could visualize this. She had power in her voice and in her expression. She was a singer. 
I've seen her walk out singing on the way to her next appearance and folks is just shouting everywhere, hats flying and carrying on and just something terrible. According to writer and gospel music producer, Anthony Halbert, those who attended her programs considered them some of the deepest experience of their lives. And gospel singer Alex Bradford likened her effect to weaving a spell within a single note. So in this sense, you can think of Mother Ford, as she stated, as a revival worker, but also um, as a conjurer or a wonder worker, someone who through singing is calling upon um, a spirit for an intended outcome, which has an effect on those who are listening to her. And we will um, explore this more a little later. Uh, noted in these observations are Mother Ford's ability to engender the same type of feeling or experience she undergoes caused by the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost, a manifestation of God within and for other uh, people through gospel. And so within the Christian tradition, we would not necessarily think of this um, as magic, but in this uh, case study, Mother Ford's use of uh, singing or utilization of um, singing uh, certain songs serves as a technology to wield a certain outcome for both herself and the persons that who are listening to her sing. First, the student uh, examines in this case can, if religious experience can accurately categorize Mother Ford's account and that of her listeners. Religious experience refers um, to any experience appropriate to a religious context or that has a religious flavor and includes various feelings such as religious awe and sublimity. So religious experience in a general sense can include participating in a church worship service, singing a hymn, singing uh, uh, a gospel uh, song, uh, praying, reading uh, liturgy, any type of uh, engagement or participation within a religious service or religious orientation can be classified um, as religious experience. And there are different types of religious um, experiences. Perhaps most are visual or auditory presentations, um, but not through a, a bodily sense or the physical eyes or ears in which subjects report seeing or hearing. This type of experience is present in Zella Price's recounting of using your mind's eye to visualize or imagine one flying away when hearing uh, Mother Ford sing. This feeling that Mother Ford herself also felt when singing gospel music. Another type of religious experience that comes through sensory experiences of ordinary or physical objects, but seems to carry um, additional information about a super mundane reality. An example of this includes um, experiencing God's nature. We see this um, in the Hebrew Bible with Moses and the burning bush in which a second person um, standing nearby could observe the same. If in the, in the, uh, in the case that if a, a person was in the same setting that they too could see um, the burning bush. Um, this type of religious experience would not be applicable, I argue, in the case of Mother Ford and her listeners. Um, there is an additional, uh, also an additional type of religious experience that is more difficult to describe and is usually regarded as ineffable. It cannot be characterized accurately in sensory language or uh, through analogy. However, the subject of this experience posits that it is real. Um, and it is a direct awareness of some religiously or spiritually significant reality external to uh, the subject. In this instance, the uncontrollable feeling within uh, Mother Ford reflects a concept of the Holy Spirit um, in the African-American religious experience. In this tradition, 
The Holy Spirit is a manifestation of God that can subject individuals to its presence by falling or descending upon them, resulting in subjects catching the Holy Ghost or getting happy. This understanding is reflected in the frenzied and trance-like behaviors of Mother Ford's listeners shouting everywhere after feeling the anointing or the presence of the Holy Spirit in her voice. The movements of these ecstatic dances resulted, resulting from the Holy Spirit falling upon her listeners through her voice does not communicate in language what the Holy Spirit is, yet subjects report knowing it by feeling it within. To be more clear here, um, if one is to shout, if one is, if one, if you are in church and you are viewing someone getting happy or shouting, the very act of them shouting does not denote or communicate what the Holy Spirit is, but it is through the person's understanding or awareness of them getting happy um, that allows them to know that they have um, had some type of religious experience. And so that is what that point um, is speaking to. A, a case um, would be made here to qualify uh, both Mother Ford and her listeners' experience as this ineffable type, but it does not totally, I argue that it does not totally encapsulate her experience because as a revival worker, the application of her voice serves as a technology to intentionally acquaint her listeners with the Holy Spirit, uh, weaving a spell, the language that uh, Zella Jackson Price used. And what I mean by this as a clinician, if you will, in this instance, uh, in having the knowledge or the anointing to engender an experience or a feeling within and for others, Mother Ford may or may not conceive of her experience with the Holy Spirit or the sacred as ineffable, specifically as it relates to singing gospel. The question then remains, can Mother Ford or her listeners' experience be considered mystical? Mystical experiences are defined as uh, super sense perceptual or sub sense perceptual unitive experiences granting acquaintance of realities or states of affairs that are not accessible by way of sense uh, perception or standard in in introspection. So simply um, a mystical experience, which is, you know, referencing mysticism, is the belief that one can obtain, that one uh, will become uh, in union with the sacred God um, or the Holy uh, Spirit. Um, and so this definition uh, does not allow the student to read Mother Ford's or listener experience as mystical because within the Black Protestant faith tradition or Black uh, or Black mainline, uh, let me back up, in a normative context within the Black mainline Protestant faith tradition, as seen in this case, subjects do not understand being Holy Ghost filled or having an encounter with the spirit as a unitive experience in which they become with one with it. Instead, they view getting happy as the Holy Spirit temporarily coming over or mounting them, um, an involuntary visitation from the third personality of the trying God, the Holy Spirit. The non-unitive uh, understanding of the encounter with the Holy Spirit in this case does allow for the student to investigate if the subcategory numinous religious experience can be applied to the subjects. The numinous experience is a non-unitive one um, that grants an acquaintance of realities or a state of affairs that are not accessible by sense perception. So um, the state of affairs in this sense would be Mother Ford's conception of being in a different world when she's singing, sense of the physical 3D space, if you will. Um, her existing, of course, in the physical and observable or material world, but 
her language is indicating that when she is singing, her consciousness is not limited by the space-time continuum. And so the numinous experience is that experience of the sacred, which is particular to religious human beings consisting of a whole other reality, that other world that she exists in when she is singing gospel music. It is the unfathomable and unpowering um, and it engenders a sense of dreaded fascination in which the religion person becomes submerged and overwhelmed by their own nothingness. Again, Mother Ford, in, in referencing her language, she is noting an absence of reality, not being present in the world. Um, and so her lack of awareness in analyzing her uh, language, um, it, it's her it denotes her lack of awareness of her physical existence in the world when singing gospel music by being Holy Ghost filled or feeling the Holy Other, the ultimate God, the divine within, fits within this description of a numinous experience. As Mother Ford's listeners' experiences can be interpreted as numinous, the frenzied behavior or shouting as a result of her numinous experience spurred by her singing can be read as a herophony in which the sacred manifests itself in their bodies in response to the holy or the holy the holy other or the holy ghost that cannot be conceived of through the senses the listeners lose the ability to control their movements or voices therefore the philosophy of religion student can classify these experiences of mother ford and her listeners as numinous in this case study and as you have heard me uh reference numerous times the importance of language, the language of the religious subjects is very critical to examine if their experiences could be analyzed through the lens of philosophy of religion. While uh, logical, while there is a school of thought who, is, who are called the logical positivists, they claim that individuals um, cannot account for religious language by linking it to experiences of the physical world because it lacks empirical consequences, rendering such language um, is meaningless. Um, there is a philosopher by the name of R.B. Braithwaite who argues that claims made in religious language are meaningful, uh, but they are not true or false because they should not be understood as assertions. He notes that claims in religious language can describe a set of mental events with which the experience itself cannot, can be, excuse me, can be identified. This criticism allows the student to consider the claims of Mother Ford and her listeners about their religious experience as meaningful and permits the students to validate claims made from their own lived religious experiences and that of their religious heritage as meaningful. In considering the importance of religious language in the examination of Mother Ford's account, I now turn to Jewish philosopher Abraham Joshua Heschel's thesis on reality and the ineffable to evaluate the meaning and function of language to describe the sacred. And because of time, I'm, I'm only going to spend a little bit of time on Heschel. Um, and I also want to be aware this is a lot, this is a lot of information that is being uh, relayed. So Heschel viewed the task of the philosopher of religion to neither contain analysis of religious experience nor the construction of religious reason. This approach to modern philosophy was coupled with his claim that any amount of rational analysis could never excavate the fullness and richness of reality. In positing that humankind apprehends more than comprehension, he argues that reason in itself contains limit and the ineffable aspect of the divine cannot be simplified to any conceptual categories. Heschel argues that, uh, well, I'm going to um, skip past that. So Heschel's emphasis on the limitation of language addresses the worth that exists in the value of what cannot be communicated. Uh, the intention he gives to the ineffable is expressed in his advancement that to become, and this is significant, to become aware of the ineffable is to part company with words. The essence, the tangent curve of human experience lies beyond the limits of language. Considering um, Heschel's 
thesis on the, the philosophy of language, um, there is um, this assertion that poetry is a method or a way to describe um, the ineffable. And so his hermeneutic presents a perspective on literature that points to a precise examination of religious discourse. While poetic expression lends humans a key in unlocking spiritual insights within sacred text and religious language, Heschel dismisses dependence on metaphors and symbols in religious acts. Heschel's theorization calls for the employment of poetry when treating religious language by what he may consider a commitment in one's desire to encounter and know God through sharpening their mind. Heschel's contention that poetic and artistic expression lends humans a key in unlocking spiritual insights to communicate with the ineffable helps us contextualize the reading of Mother Ford and more broadly an analysis of singing gospel music as religious and uh, mystical experiences. While he and I'm ending, I'll end with this. While Heschel speaks of the ineffable uh, within the Black sacred prophetic tradition, we interrogate the concept uh, a little bit differently. Walter Hart, Walter Hawkins uh, rearticulates the uh, question of the ineffable in this way. What is this, this feeling that is deep inside that keeps setting my soul afire? Whatever it is, it won't let me hold my peace. And so in this exercise, um, I have attempted to uh, center a culturally relevant text relative to my experience as a religious adherent in historically a Black tradition, solidifying one's understanding of major concepts within the field of study. This attempt also proves that the young Black scholar of religion can center themselves within discourse, moving from what Bell Hooks identifies as the margins to the center to both consider and challenge central arguments within the subdiscipline of philosophy of religion comfortably. And that is the conclusion of the lecture. We can uh, now um, move to the Q&A format, and I'm so happy to be, well, let me stop my share. I am um, so happy to be in conversation with Minister uh, Davis, who actually helped me conceive a portion um, of the paper. Okay, there we go. Thank you, Mr. Pratt, for that um, that that very informative lecture. I, I I want to go ahead and jump right in. I I have a couple of questions for you. The one the first one I want to start off with is, um, can you explain what mysticism is for the saints? Sure. Um, uh, and I I talked about this earlier. And uh, mysticism is always a uh, an interesting. Um, point of conversation, especially if one talks about it within the context of uh, the African American Christian tradition, um, and so mysticism, just quite broadly, is uh, is a belief um, that uh, one can enter in union or uh, absorption um, into a deity or the ultimate or the absolute, um, and this type of um, spiritual um, apprehension of, of knowledge is not accessible um, to the uh, intellect. And so it can be um, attained through certain modes of contemplation, um, through sacrifice or uh, self-surrender. we, um, a lot of, uh, well, uh, there's a, a couple of, a few um, technologies uh, you, I'm using the word technologies used um, within uh, various forms of mysticism. Uh, one familiar um, is uh, fasting within the uh, Christian tradition, um, abstaining uh, food to concentrate 
um, one's mind on uh, the spiritual, to situate themselves within the spiritual realm to achieve uh, a certain outcome. And it is through, and it is um, in which uh, when one um, devotes or directs attention um, to that which is non-material, that they have the time, the bandwidth, and the capacity to focus on uh, the sacred. And through that contemplation, they are able to become one with and unify uh, with the sacred. Um, and so that is that is a, a, a synopsis of what uh, mysticism is. And so I I heard you talk about becoming one with the sacred. And in your paper, you mentioned uh, you 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 have a quote of uh, Mother Ford, and she and she says um, she just doesn't know what takes over her. Um, people share this same um, testimony when they talk about what what we as church folks just call getting happy. But um, you you took it all the way back to the rain shot. And so can you um, talk about some of the, the, the more present African-American expressions in Christianity and then also touch on um, the, the ring shout and how that was uh, essential to, to gospel music as a, as a sacred uh, technology, as you, you called it. Sure. Um, so firstly, I wanted to want to clarify um, in the in the presentation and, and in this paper, I am um, arguing that Mother Ford's uh, account can be classified um, as a religious um, experience, specifically the ineffable uh, type in which language does not permit one to accurately or wholly describe um, their experience. And then also, um, as it relates to the mystical experience, there are two types of mystical experiences, one being unitive and one being non-unitive. Within the African-American Christian tradition, the types of mystic ex mystical experiences that we see, in my opinion, are the non-unitive ones. Um, and I say this because we reference getting uh, happy or shouting or being filled by the Holy Spirit um, in which it, you know, the, the Holy Spirit descends or falls upon us. We do not necessarily become or within the tradition, we do not necessarily become one with it. And this is also this is um, not Sterling Stuckey. Albert Rabato talks about this um, in slave religion. Um, the retention um, from um, uh, West Africa of spirit possession in which the spirit is said to mount um, and ride um, their horse. Uh, and the, the, the spirit takes over the heads um, of their devotees. So in this sense, um, within that uh, lineage, the, the shouting within the African-American Christian context can be viewed as a non-unitive um, mystical uh, experience. Um, to your um, second point um, about the ring shout, um, it was important um, in my analysis to situate gospel music within its historic origins of um, the ring shout particularly in dealing with um, gospel blues, because in using the in using a, the Durkin Hines concept, I'm arguing that blues comes out just as gospel music does, blues also comes out of the ring shout. And Sterling Stucking argues in his book, Slave Cultures, that the ring shout is the origin and the basis of all um, sacred and creative expressions, well, all sacred forms of creative expression. And so various art forms come out of the ring shout as this unifying um, element among different um, African ethnic groups and uh, tribes at the time. So at, what they would do, they would abscond um, uh, some, you know, away from the, their captor's view at night um, and and uh, perform or engage in this ritualistic circle um, 
uh, dance, which reflected their cosmology, as I referenced in the, the lecture, um, uh, uh, there's a particular uh, cosmogram known as the Kalunga line, which reflects the, the four moments of the suns. Above represents the land of the living. Uh, below represents the, the land of the dead or the, the ancestors. And so while different um, African groups um, have different deities. Uh, there um, is a, a commute. There was a communal understanding um, in uh, the creator and the nature of being and life. And so all of this is expressed through movements, uh, um, through the dance, through the ring shout. And so gospel music comes out of this, and so does the blues. So it was essential that I highlighted this nuance in explaining the fluidity of the of Durkenheim's categories, why blues can be read as sacred, why gospel can be read as sacred, and vice versa. Yes, that's mighty. Um, before we bring Pastor Crowley on to give us our closing remarks and to lead us um, in, our, in our prayer, I, I want to ask you, how does Heschel's thesis on the ineffable unpacked subject material regarding the philosophy of language in the case study of Mother Ford? Okay, I'm gonna stop you right there. I want you to open up for people to ask some questions. I don't know if you, you probably didn't see that with me saying that in the chat. That's okay. So I don't, ha I've, I've been looking, I don't, I don't have any, unless there are some, are, do we have any um, on Zoom right now? Any questions? Deacon Reed, do you have a question? I think you're muted. Okay, Deacon Reed, then Deacon Lane. She's, she's muted. But she, is she talking to us? Yeah. I think she's trying to get herself unmuted. Um, do either yeah. of you, there we go. Yeah, yeah. I'm, 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 I'm listening. It's, a lot of it is kind of complicated and out of my league. Uh, yeah, as an older woman, but I'm trying to think. Uh, I remember growing up, and we had in the islands we had these. Uh, it's a group of people, and they would go out and have uh, meetings by the highway, and they kind of put me in uh, 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 more like what you say about uh, Mother Smith there. Because they would come and gather in the crossroads and whatever, and they would preach. And they would jump, they call it Zion. They jump Zion, they go, whom, whom, whom. And they would preach and stay there like for hours. And then, they, and then the next day they have a thing, they set up more like a booth and they go, fasting and praying, maybe till 12 o'clock and whatever. And it's just a group of women. So some of the things you're saying kind of put me in mind of those women, like with the African way of jumping and preaching and fasting and praying. Uh, like they'll go more than a day too. Sometimes they go two consecutive days in a row and they were happy doing that but it's just a group of people that did that it was like the pastors in the churches and whatever those were so i know that comes from the african part of it but uh some of this stuff you're saying there is kind of out of my league but i kind of grab as and run with as much as i could but I, I kind of love that, uh, some of what you explain. So we, we can tell that this African singing and whatever, it wasn't like preaching. It, it comes way back that I might never understand. So that's my comment. I'm not a question, it's like a comment. Thank you for, for sharing that. <laughs> and, and certainly 